afternoon. It's my honor and privilege to welcome you to an exchange for media presents from recovery to reinvention, building brands for the long haul, powered by Salesforce. Today we have a stalwart from this industry and many leaders from India. Uh, we have Mr. Toby Jenner, who's the CEO of WaveMaker, and uh, he's going to tell us how to go from recovery to reinvention and how do we build brands for the long haul. He's somebody who's uh, you know, help clients build brands in his current leadership role as well as in his past roles. And uh, he's a keen observer of consumer behavior and working with clients to build locker value. We also have Mr. Atit Mehta, who's the CMO of Baijus, Subhas Srinivasan Ayer, who's the CMO at Godrej, Mr. Yeshdeep Vaishnav from Salesforce, Meera Ayer from Medlife, and my co founder uh, and friend, Nawal, uh, for this conversation. I'll start by uh, having a conversation about Toby because Toby is based in the UK and as the global CEO for WaveMaker, he not only has an idea of what happens in the UK, but he has a kind of a ringside view to what's happening in various different markets. Are there similarity between those markets? What are the unique, uh, you know, behaviors that are happening with consumers and hence brands are trying to kind of follow that. So let me welcome all our guests, but especially Mr. Toby Jenner first. Mr. Toby Jenner, welcome to the Exchange for Media talk. And we're happy that we're talking to you. Uh, how have been the last uh, 100 odd days for you, Toby? Uh, firstly, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm thrilled to, uh, to have been invited. So thank you, Anurag, that's very kind. Uh, the last 100 days, well, look, let's go back to the last 200 days because I, I joined WaveMaker in September of last year. And uh, I had a very clear plan for the year ahead of me, uh, which didn't include uh, a global pandemic. So uh, I just uh, wish every person who started a new job this year uh, well, because it's been, it's been challenging. I think it's been, uh, I'm glad I had six months prior to March uh, to put in place a number of the areas that we wanted to address. Uh, so we were in good shape. And I think ultimately uh, the last four or five months, whether it's been COVID or in the US Black Lives Matter, it's been, uh, it's been a hugely challenging time. And it's been a, it's a, been a time where communication and sharing of information has been more important than ever before. And I, I joked with my colleagues at the start, we were having calls every day uh, in the first week of April, last week of March as we went into lockdown in the UK and, and across Europe uh, and, and the States about sharing information, for false news. And it was false news because everything was changing so quickly. The information we were sharing went out of date literally every day. But it was a choice of you either share what's relevant as of that moment in time or you wouldn't be sharing anything. So we made the decision that we would share on an ongoing basis every day uh, certainly for the first three or four weeks. So uh, it's been challenging, but it's, uh, it's been good. And uh, I'm pleased to say the team's been incredible. And the changes we made for WaveMaker, we, we built a new uh, product uh, with one global operating system so we could connect globally. We had a very clear new proposition around positively provoking growth for our clients and our people. And you know, a time of crisis is one you should never let go to waste. And certainly building that provocation uh, at a time like this has been, uh, has been a real rich area uh, for us and for our clients. So it's been busy, but rewarding ultimately. You know, we had two hours in our con conversation it was about, you know, kind of reviving and then reinventing, uh, but you added, uh, another third hour in this conversation. But let me go back to a fundamental question. Um, do you see demand in business in various parts of the world coming back in the next six months? Let's take UK as a market, which you really know, and then try to look at some other markets and look at how consumers are thinking. You know, I don't... Demand of our services has never gone away. No, I'm not uh, talking about demand of... Uh, media services or advertising. No, no, no. In fact, no, no, no. in fact, I, I keep saying, Toby, that in good times you should advertise, and in bad times you must. Yeah. So, well, I, 
So, yeah. so and you do need specialists. Wise, wise words. No, look, I think it's, it's no secret that the market has declined uh, considerably around the world. You know, we're seeing, we're seeing huge uh, deflation around the world. I think when I, when I look at it at a global level, uh, you know, we're back about 11.8%. So the market's declined down to, it's your mobile, you need to turn off. Uh, the market's declined back to about 517 billion. Uh, so that's, uh, a, a, you know, a huge number, but we, we haven't really felt that decline in, we haven't been less busy because of the amount of work and the recalibration that we've do, been doing for, for our clients. So, you know, what we're seeing is 2019 at about 11 billion. Uh, that was up about 6%, uh, about 587 billion. And then we're seeing, uh, this year, you know, a decline, as I say, of around 517 billion, so back 11.8%. And I think next year we'll capture probably two thirds of that. We'll recover two thirds of that, and then we'll go back to growth versus 19 in 2022. So, you know, one year of pandemic, and I would say two years of recovery, uh, but certainly uh, recovery is what we'll have. And within that, what we're seeing is, is, innovation and clients working in very different ways to ensure that their business strength is maintained. So if I think about clients, if I think about 2008 and the uh, financial crisis, what we saw was uh, digital coming to the fore more than ever before. And I think what we're seeing this time round is commerce, e-commerce coming to the fore and direct to consumer strategies uh, and clients that were ahead have accelerated through this. So certain clients I know where the bricks and mortar business shut, uh, but their e-commerce business made up the gap. So actually they were only back uh, in single digit revenue declines because the e-commerce business grew disproportionately. So I think we're seeing many different ways of developing, uh, you know, buying online, picking up at stores. So uh, stores whilst not open become uh, centers for distribution. So there's many wonderful innovations. And I think we've seen more innovation in the last four months than the last four years. It's, it's truly astounding how our clients have uh, developed. And, you know, I would hope that we're supporting them on that journey. You know, thank you, Toby, for telling us that D2C is becoming bigger, e-commerce is becoming bigger. And you see that at some stage, uh, we start to see brands being even more active than they were pre-COVID. Uh, now, if, brand, if consumers' behavior is changed and brands are engaging in a new way, because uh, you can't disengage with the consumer, right? You've got to be in continuous uh, engagement. Now, how are you reinventing the communication and in some way reinventing what you do? Uh, the client's uh, uh, behavior has to mirror your behavior and in some way you have to lead the conversation. That's how you become a trusted advisor and beyond a media procurement, uh, you know, sure. agency, so to say. So how are you reinvent, reinventing your offering, especially digital has become so big. Uh, if you talk to any marketer, conversations are more often around digital and how uh, spends in digital need to go up, how performance marketing needs to grow, how D2C channels need to be set up, you know. So give us a... a input into how you're reinventing what you do to serve yeah. your clients today yeah so so when i came into the role in september i i came without any uh, baggage so i was very uh, open with my colleagues that said you can change anything and everything the only thing we're going to keep is the name wave maker because i think that talks disruption provocation uh, and transformation and for me those were the, the pillars that I wanted to build the organization on. Uh, we, we, as I said, reinvented the product we sell to our clients. We built what we call provocative planning and we built it around three modules. And the reason I mentioned this is because I think modularity of approach, the ability to dive in and out of individual uh, modules is infinitely more uh, fast to market, infinitely more agile uh, and infinitely more uh, flexible for our clients. 
versus a sequential process, which every other agency has. So every other agency starts with some sort of barrier and finishes with some sort of measurement framework. And you have to go through 10, 12, 14, eight steps, however many it may be. And again, as I say, the reason I tell you this is because we were very proud of that because we thought it was a provocative way to go to market. And then COVID hit. And then what we, we saw was an absolute need for agility, an absolute need for flexibility, uh, and an absolute need for connectivity. So what we'd already developed, and we, funnily enough, we were in Mumbai launching this uh, to 200 colleagues from around the world the last week of February, feels like a, a lifetime ago now. Uh, but it took on even more importance in the COVID world. So as we were rolling this out, during lockdown across 12 test markets of which India was one, uh, it became for us ever more important. So that flexibility and that agility through a modular approach really helps lead our clients. From a, from a client perspective, uh, one of the modules was all around what we call unlock. How do you unlock additional value from your digital ecosystem that is available there. And we look across seven different areas uh, from commerce to search, to social, to programmatic, to different audiences, to the content. Uh, and we have a depth of questionnaire that I would say is better than any consultant grade audit. And where that gets you to is the ability to benchmark yourself versus either best in market, uh, best across markets, your competitive set, and then maps those areas where you can improve against uh, ease of delivery and impact on your business. So you're focusing on where you can grow and how easily you can deliver against those areas and then we map it chronologically. So it gives you, as I say, a consultant grade audit within four days. And again, to the point around flexibility and agility, it's speed, it's speed of market, and it's ensuring that if there are dollars left on the table, we know where they are and how to unlock them uh, immediately. So that, that was something that, as I say, we, we were proud of the, where we got to at the end of Feb. Fast forward four months and we look at where we are now, it's uh, even more relevant. You know, Toby, uh, one of the things is that before COVID, everybody was on a digital journey. So that, that digital journey has been kind of accelerated by COVID. Now tell us how WaveMaker sees digital transformation as the core area for its clients. You know, tell us what are you, you've already shared uh, about this new framework, uh, which helps you kind of benchmark and kind of get a way forward in four days, as you said. Tell mm -hmm. us, uh, how are you playing the role of a partner in this digital transformation of clients? Well, I as I say, I think uh, that that's one such way. I don't think it should ever replace human human interaction, human ingenuity. So that's one of three modules uh, unlock. That's about delivering growth today uh, in a in a digital transformation environment. We have two other modules. One about delivering growth ongoing. So that's about maximizing. Uh, your your performance in market and then the third module is around transforming so that's about breaking category conventions that's about uh, looking at broader annual plans uh, and how we would grow within that I mean I think I think within digital we have to break it apart a bit because for me the opportunity as we've seen through COVID is really around e-commerce and if I look at India as a market and the size and scale of your uh, country, the opportunity is absolutely vast. You know, you've only got 52% uh, internet penetration. And if you think that most of the e-commerce will be fueled by that, then the growth of another 100 million users estimated to get you to about 829 million by next year, it's, a, it's a, an opportunity to, uh, if you invest ahead, I mean, you were saying you have to invest in times of recession, I would say if you've got a strong business, you absolutely should to grow market share in the short term. So I think it's a combination of smartphone penetration, smartphone growth, 
you know, you're the fastest growing in the top 20 markets around the world. You've got 152 million up 8%, which is, you know, staggering growth. So our clients, we need to be educating our clients how to take advantage of that, as I say, and, and through some of the ways in which we've gone to market, I think there's, there's real opportunity there. So looking at e-commerce, looking at direct to consumer to ensure that we improve our client's margin, because that's how they'll have margin rich relationships, keeping uh, consumers central to those conversations, talking to consumers to ensure it's a seamless uh, relationship online, I think are all, all absolutely critical. And, and as I say, we're helping on any number of those levels. I mean, we, we did a huge piece of work uh, through COVID uh, around the impact uh, of consumers and brands and uh, the impact on consumers. And what we're seeing is much more anxiety. Uh, I'm sure that's, that's true in India. Um, so I think brands can play a role in, in uh, managing that. You know, brands as a utility to help manage that anxiety. We're seeing much more localization you know, people being locked down, traveling less. Uh, I think that impacts the type of brands that you have exposure to. So much more of a local brand versus global brands potentially. So again, how do you connect back into a community, a local community? Uh, and I'm always incredibly proud of the work that we do in India from a purpose perspective. But I think that takes on even more importance now, you know, brands, connecting locally through purpose, I think will be critical moving forward. And then the third one is how brands behave in, in the home. You know, homes have taken on a whole different meaning rather than being somewhere where we kind of sleep and eat. Uh, they have become our workplace, they've become our, our gyms, they've become our centers of learning, as well as, uh, you know, uh, for, for the family and uh, for for our social social bubbles. So how do brands behave in, in that environment? I think again is very different to how they've behaved before. So how brands behave and support around anxiety, around locality, uh, and around the home. Uh, again, that would be another area in which we would help support. And again, digital plays a very key role in many of those areas. Uh, more so than any other channels because they're there and available. You know, if you can't go out, your out of home becomes less relevant, cinema becomes less relevant. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, the Bollywood uh, has been disproportionately impacted as Hollywood has as well. So, you know, they're just and some... Cricket of the, and soccer. Well, and Olympics. I know. And, uh, well, we, we, had, we had our first test match. I uh, know. Last I week. I uh, so uh, we're feeling very good because we won yesterday. So, but yeah, absolutely, sport. It's been an incredible run for the English cricket team last two years. It's been just... Not to mention my football team, Liverpool, as well. So we're all very good on the sport yes. front. So, uh, you know, I, Toby, I could go on talking to you, but we have a panel of CMOs and business leaders waiting. Just before I hand it over to Nawal to kind of moderate that, of which you are part, if you had to make three suggestions or inputs to CMOs, or let's put it, if you had to make three predictions for future, what would those be in the context of marketing services, media services, and the digital transformation that we are talking from, from reviving to reinvention? Yeah. Well, it's interesting your reinvention because that does talk to, you talk about longer term. I think we have to manage and balance long term with short term. Uh, and so therefore, I think agility is something that will be, you know, people talk about new norms. Uh, I'm not sure they're new. I think they're just accelerated or dialed up. But certainly agility is one that I think uh, clients, agencies uh, need to have more of. And as I, I explained, I, I feel very comfortable with where Wavemaker are on that front. I think the uh, ability to uh, collaborate uh, and to find solutions uh, across multiple partners is, is going to be uh, increasingly important. You know, flexibility about how people are working from home, working in the office, what, what focused work is, one-to-one you know, -one work, hands-on keyboards versus, versus that collaborative work that I just spoke about, I think will be different. 
And I think if you if you haven't got a, a, a an e-commerce solution, if you haven't got a D2C solution, then come and talk to Wavemaker and we'll, we'll help you get one. Thank you, Toby. It's been a pleasure talking to you and I hope to see you sometime on a um, you know, cricket field and maybe watch a match together and I go out for some beers after that. But till then, uh, we can, uh, you know, we do it through video conferencing technology. I hand over to Naval, my co-founder, and a very eminent panel of CMOs and business leaders. Uh, Naval, all over to you. Thanks, Anurag. Thank you, Anurag, and uh, thank you for uh, engaging Chris on the station. Thank you, Toby, for joining us. Uh, you didn't have to fly and, down. And Toby, that was not my mobile. That was my line phone. Mobile, I put on silent. That I forgot to give away, so my apologies for that. Don't apologize, it's fine. Thank you so much for having me, it's very kind. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Anurag. Uh, thank you, Toby, and let me also now uh, welcome our panelists who are uh, in their own right, uh, some of India's top CMOs. I have with me Atit Mehta, Head of Marketing for Baiju's, which is India's one of the premier unicorns, as you all know, now owned uh, partially by Disney. Uh, there is Mira Life on the panel, the CMO of Metal Life, an insurance company. Uh, there is Ritesh Gosal, CMO Chroma Infinity Retail, a pure play uh, retail company. There's Subhash Srinivasan Iyer, head of media for Godrej Consumer Products, who we all of, as all of us know, is a very large FMCG company in India. And last but not the least, Yashdeep Vaishnav, regional director for Salesforce. And as you know, Salesforce has a lot of tools that help marketers. And we are here to have a conversation about what's happening during uh, COVID time. So. Welcome panelists, you can uh, you know, switch on your videos if you'd like uh, so that uh, the audience can at least see us. So let me uh, you know, lay the context for the conversation we are going to have and then get to each one of you and ask you a few pointers. So from what we have seen uh, in the last four months in COVID, what's happened is uh, businesses are disrupted, right? Especially the uh, traditional legacy businesses as we have uh, you know, seen and the impact on traditional legacy business is also unequal. So an auto company is far more impacted than, for example, a FMCG company is, whereas an e-commerce company is much lesser impacted. An e-education company is even lesser impacted. In fact, an e-education company is gained uh, uh, because of the lockdown. My question to uh, the panelists, maybe we can start with Toby. Toby, you've seen now uh, COVID has been in place for the last four months, five months, and uh, Wavemaker works with a swathe of uh, clients across categories what are if you were to put up you know kind of two three buckets what are the biggest challenges you've seen when it comes to communication from clients to consumers uh well a couple uh first and foremost brands that haven't been true to themselves have failed so authenticity is not new uh, but I think it's been compounded by COVID. I think everyone, uh, certainly in the UK uh, work, I've seen it all looks, it's all been shot on iPhones. It's all about, you know, family being together. And I think ultimately there are brands that can play in that space and brands that should play in that space. I think a client of ours, Mondelez, has been fantastic in that because they've got a, a brand platform around generosity, which lends itself perfectly to that behavior. But other brands that have tried to jump into that space have failed because they don't have that, uh, that genuine reason to play in that space. So I think, I think uh, having that brand purpose that I spoke about earlier uh, is, has been central to how people have behaved uh, in, in, in a COVID world. Right. Let me hop across to uh, Shubha. Shubha is, uh, as I mentioned, part of one of the India's largest FMCG companies. And Shubha, you have a category of products across the entire gamut. Some of them are you know, very essential, daily need products, whereas the others are you know, in a different bucket. And each one of them has a different TG, different communication needs. So tell us your learnings, you know, especially in terms of what challenges have you faced? What are some of the successes you've seen uh, during COVID times? So, uh, I think uh, first and foremost, in my entire career, the last four or five months have taught me collectively what, you know, probably another four years would have never taught me. 
there is a certain way that we are used to you know planning i mean like you rightly said the multiple categories and the multiple audience sets that we have we saw all these multiple audience universe completely shaken up in terms of their behavior in terms of the way they were purchasing even within essential categories the way they were purchasing and the way their own physical environments were disturbed now the disturbances that we observed are actually not only physical not only the anxiety and the fear that anurag spoke about but there is also a real issue in terms of production disruption and supply chains and uh, as a company procurement all the processes everything was disrupted right now in this kind of a scenario uh, we did one thing which is you know continuously looking out for customer queues so we upped this entire whole consumer understanding segment that really helped us a lot uh, the other point was that immediately you know sort of getting our supply chain back to action that is another thing sorry. and uh, sorry for to, tell us uh, when you say you you looked at customer queues uh, more closely how did you do that uh, okay okay yeah so i think i should have elaborated on that front we are so used to traditionally doing our customer contact our consumer research in a certain way uh, navel uh, i think uh, we went uh, into this work from home mode by mid march i think by last week of march as an organization we had taken this entire decision of how we would actually meet consumers virtually and we started you know keeping that channel open and uh, subsequently we completely moved on to connecting with our consumers online calls video chats groups everything uh, you know online and uh, that's a very valuable uh, you know learning uh, we were listening to consumers concerns very attentively we understood a lot of health cues you know coming our way and uh, i would say that if i were to give you the i think the best example to give you would be this whole set of around 12 products a range that we launched for protect uh, around the home care around personal care and kitchen you know three segments within brand name protect and 12 products launched in a span of just the last few months you know that's massive so my whole learning has been that today agility matters more than anything else and unlearning and uh, between unlearning and adapting honestly we are living in a current volatility where nobody actually has any time to train and to trust the process and to perfect it so there is no scope of that so you have to keep improving being flexible as you learn and you have to adapt and experiment that's the whole you know essence of how we have seen changes happen protect is an example in the same way we have multiple examples of turning around new communication you gone and made uh, you know films using consumers the communication part of it so lot of these uh, steps you know we probably would have never done it i ask same way and uh, that's the whole point that uh, today living in the middle of this whole pandemic in the middle of you know the consumers going through so much of fear and anxiety livelihoods being affected we have a whole basket of essential items which you know primarily address a household an indian household and uh, when i look at all these categories and i look at all these brands the first point that you know is most important for us as an organization is what is it that we can do to address an immediate need that a consumer faces are there cues that they are either telling us signaling us or can we intently figure out if there are any immediate needs that are going to emerge and irrespective of what we have been following in our you know uh, process are there ways in which we can cut short the entire process come out with something new which is going to address that need gap right i'm going to pick up uh... one of these points with you when i come back to you let me just talk sure. to meera now meera you're an interesting category one of my friends was telling me insurance requirement has boomed that thing right. i messaged you yeah, medlife is india's largest e-health platform we right. uh, 
we allow people to order medicines and deliver them home as well as uh, a little book lab diagnostics at home my apologies so medicine demand has gone the same way so that doesn't change uh, change much but tell me uh, at a time when uh, you have consumer attention so focused on uh, you know self care at the same time care for their family members and what's happening around them their jobs what's happening with colleagues what do what do companies like yours do when you are doing communication because there is always this you know red thin line of going overboard and you know every time i get a sales message from a pharma or a medical company you know a part of me wants to block those uh, messages because you know it's like somebody trying to uh, sell them their services and goods and trying to take advantage of your adversity so for a company like medlife uh, what would you do uh, uh, during covid times to make sure that one you reach out to your right consumers and two you also don't cross that uh, red line sure so uh, uh, naval i think two parts to it the first one where you said that uh, how to how do we ensure that you reach out to the right set of customers uh, this wasn't a problem at all as you've seen across india e-commerce and all sale of essential goods on e-commerce has shot up organically right so even without us having to spend marketing dollars uh, demand went up 2x through april right. may and has now settled on to a new normal level so Uh, getting demand in was never an issue uh, through this entire lockdown it only accelerated the problem was more servicing the demand because no matter uh, what you think you are never you, uh, or never have i seen overnight demand spike to 2x without even spending anything right uh, and therefore nobody was prepared and on top of that you had lockdown and all the all the associated problems uh, including manpower at that time so i think uh, the first question in terms of how to reach out to the right people my answer is more in terms of saying that how as an organization we decided whom do we want to ensure that we service and retain right because as an e-commerce company uh, you already have a very large base of customers especially medlife medlife has almost uh, more than 10 million customer base now uh, thanks to data and thanks to the kind of digital and you know enhancements that have happened you know exactly what is that set of 100000 or top 200000 most valuable customers that you have who not only drive your business revenues but also growth for the future so it was very important to very quickly identify the set and say that come what may despite the fact that demand has soared and you have cohorts from 3 years and 4 years back coming back to you you keep razor uh, no razor sharp focus on this most valuable customer set of yours and ensure that you service them um and uh, that's what we did at medlife and coming on to the second part of it in terms of communication and how you don't go overboard i think uh, you know what shubha said uh, we essentially tailored our communication around to what we heard and listened to our customers from right so our customers uh, and in fact we did a survey very quickly in march itself and what customers said um, march and april first week is one uh, 74% said that they were not quite sure of the news and the various um, information that they were getting around covid 85% said that they would like to hear from experts and not from news broadcasters or indeed friends etc about covid and you had a similarly high number of people more than uh, more than some 60 odd percent saying that they did not quite know what to believe and what not to believe now with respect to covid having gotten this insight from our customers it was very easy given that we have a panel of about a 50 of, of 1500 doctors around the country we quickly moved to just creating doctor videos and uh, telling people that listen this is a doctor and doctor is saying this believe this and obviously brand comes with a lot of trust and it immediately helped move that conversation from just pure play commerce and uh, transaction to more engagement and more what how we could help as an organization Uh, and actually stick to our vision of uh, improving health outcomes for people so i think that 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 was a very quick change that we did in terms of communication given that organically demand was so high and i think it paid off uh, in terms of uh, there being a lot of goodwill uh, of course we had the worst of customer experience but at the same time we also had the best of engagement and um, in a way from at least the most valuable set of customers a lot of gratitude for having uh, kept them in good health through this entire period let me now hop across to atit atit you are an envious position uh e learning uh demand has gone through the roof you guys can't handle it uh in times like these uh 
and every marketer faces challenges when it comes to communication because the boss always wants more customers so what are the top challenges you faced as a company because for you product demand is not a challenge logistics is again not really a challenge some bandwidth issues here and there but that's not really a, a big deal so what are the challenges when it comes to a you know when you don the marketer's hat what are the challenges you faced yeah so no no novel uh, i think there were like enough and more challenges uh, some of them were known and some of them were not known yeah but the number one challenge which we faced in terms of that what are we going to do as far the lockdown is concerned and especially for kids while an fmcg company launched a protect uh, a medical delivery company launched a lot of engagement and drove uh, sort of a experience with their top set of consumers but for us it was the entire country was on a lockdown and uh, schools were shut so the first thing which we did and it was really really fast track at least in my entire career i have never seen something uh, getting launched so fast especially a tech product so from a learning company we also became a teaching company so byjuice is now a learning and a teaching company so the number one what challenge was to ensure that everybody who does not have the means to do online learning while while metro cities a grade schools they all started online classes but that might be 1 or 2% of the total population as far schools are concerned yeah but if you look at mass india most of the schools didn't have the facility to start online education and so the first thing which we did is we started taking live classes so our prominent teachers top teachers india's best teachers came and they started taking sessions exactly the way the sessions are going to happen in school it was a scheduled session so for example standard fourth biology on a thursday at 4 o'clock then friday there is a chemistry and then saturday there is a maths on and so forth so on an average about 6 to 7 session sessions were created so it wasn't a challenge but to get this thing going became a huge huge burden because time was running out by the time we realized that we want to do this to setting it up to ensuring the content is ready to ensuring the studios are ready to ensuring that people know about it passing on the communication digitally and getting students to participate was the number one challenge and thankfully we overcame that but apart from that there were a lot of other small small challenges in terms of demand supply you are absolutely right that there has been a surge in demand but we had a huge issue in supply because our product is a physical kit which goes out to you and that kit contains lot of items one of the biggest items was a tablet where a person goes to the, the educational videos a uh, courier services and educational courier services was not part of the essential services as far dispatch is concerned or as far courier is concerned so there was huge amount of demand huge amount of expectation but we couldn't dispatch our kits but slowly and gradually everything uh, came to a situation wherein we could manage it uh, people who were far off from the center of dispatch they started getting delivery fast we figured out a way we had our own people somehow getting to their houses especially in the big metros so small small challenges but i think the biggest challenge was to create something back for the consumers and happy to say that we did it in about 3 weeks post the lockdown just think i'll come back to you on that yes deep salesforce again uh, a company that works across the board with a large category of clients so if you why don't you give us a gist of you know what has been your experience in the last three four months of having worked uh, with these clients across categories what according to you have uh, if you were to bucket these challenges in say two three areas what would be those two three areas for your clients so sure. so uh, if i was to bucket this into can you hear me well yeah yeah so if i was to bucket this i would largely put it in three buckets so there are people that are investing or using this time to kind of make those investments or decisions to uh understand as to what the challenges and thereby how can let's say a salesforce or any of the other enterprise solution help them so there is one set of customers that's still buying uh the second is somebody who says okay it's covid let's not talk uh maybe we talk when things are good and then yeah. there is a third category which is you know saying that okay uh i'm going to do all my research during this time but i won't take a decision now i would you know be ready what with what i want to buy let's say in a month from now or two months from now but i wouldn't buy right now i would buy when things open up funds come in whatever could be their reason so there are these three types of customers that we are largely seeing but then there is if i break it down by let's say industry segments uh, we are seeing a huge spike in the edtech okay so likes of uh, you know byju's and a lot of other people uh, are already 
uh, you know, making the most of this time, right? I mean, there is so much that you can do during this time in terms of uh, not just your brand recall, but also customer acquisition. So that's predominantly one area where we're seeing a huge spike. We've seen a, uh, I would say a curve, uh, you know, when you look at, let's say other categories of, let's say in a manufacturing or a retail or the standard education, but largely it's been, it's been uh, anyone that's e-com wants to do, move from an offline to an online. So there are customers who are uh, probably about 90% of their uh, sales or uh, revenues are offline. And they are now saying that, okay, I want to move online. Uh, and, you know, Mira spoke about, you have those 1 million customers and you have these 200,000, which are looking good, but how do you make sure that the rest of the 800,000, you are able to kind of nurture them to bring them up to the value chain of somebody who gives you as much ROI as 200,000. So there is that set of people also. And there are people who say, okay, I know my 1 million people very well. How can you help me acquire new customers? So it's a mixed bag. Right. What, about, what about you guys have been hard because, you know, naturally uh, off, uh, offline uh, sales are all uh, grounded to a halt. Even now uh, in many cities, uh, shops have not opened. Uh, the online retail piece uh, is, 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 a, is a, you know, complex matrix. It's not easy to deliver put on air conditioners uh, only through online sales. So what, what have you guys been, uh, you know, trying to figure out in these last three months, both in terms of, you know, what is the kind of way forward for a company, for a brand like you for the next immediate, I'm sure sales will come back once everything is back normal, but say the next three months and what has been your consumer reach out uh, approach? So two, three things, let me first correct you. Our stores are open around 130 or 160 stores are open. Uh, right. The stores which are open are running at around 15% lower sale than last year. Uh, so it's incorrect to say that business is at a standstill. Uh, in fact, what has happened is as soon as uh, you know lockdown started receding, uh, we started opening our stores. And uh, initially, there was a huge pent up demand because work from home also means you need to be equipped to work from home. Uh, in smartphones, suddenly people wanted a camera, a front-facing camera, which will do justice to their face. Uh, you wanted yeah. a better quality laptop at home uh, because suddenly household help disappeared. You needed a vacuum cleaner, dishwasher, washing machine, a lot of convenience products. You were killing so much time at home, you needed a television. Uh, so there was a, there was a huge pent-up demand uh, starting the second, third week of May. Uh, even now, uh, as I said, we are running at around 15% below last year. And actually the problem is supply more than its demand. So you're at 85% uh, for like-to-like -like, uh, stores? Yeah, yes. yeah. Like-to-like -like stores are at 85%. Of course, 30 odd stores are not open because of malls not being opened and all yeah. that. But the bigger challenge is supply. It's not demand. Yeah. Uh, the only uh, category where we, we and all our competitors got stuck is ACs because you had stocked up uh, before the season started. Uh, the entire season got washed out virtually. Even though people would want a second AC in their home because the kid is studying in one room while you know you are uh, working in the next room, uh, because of the absence of uh, delivery and installation uh, partners in a, in a lot of cases, or you know lockdown and you're not able to deliver the AC, there are challenges. So that's that's really where the market is. <clears throat> Coming now to you know uh, the question about engagement. Uh, so, uh, like Toby said at the beginning, brand, brands need to stick to what they are known for. Every brand has a ribbit from its customers and you should speak that language. You can't break out of that. That's one. Second is, uh, when people are going through tough times, they like hearing a familiar voice. You, it's, it's like, you know, wanting to hear from a friend, uh, when you are in lockdown. Uh, so starting somewhere in, uh, the beginning of April, uh, our social listening, we didn't do any research, but social listening, we picked up a very interesting cue, which fits well with Chroma, Chroma as, uh, Chroma as a brand, which is, you know, apart from all the talk of gloom and doom and COVID and what it's doing, there was this interesting thing of how the skies are clearing up, the water in the Ganges is suddenly, you know, crystal clear. You can see the Himalayas from Jalandhar and so on and so forth. 
so we picked on this as a trend uh, because we have been talking about uh, you know responsible consumption for a few years and we built a campaign around this uh, through all of april and the early part of may that's really what we focused on building a digital narrative about you know saying of course this this today will pass everything passes this too shall pass once we come back uh, you know what will the new normal be like will we go back to consuming in the old way or will we be a little more responsible in the way we buy stuff so that's the narrative we built uh, in in terms of engagement and probably because it was you know a uh, you know very clean window in which to talk to people lots of people had lots of time uh, this was this has been by far a most ca- successful campaign across all digital platforms so that's on the on the uh, campaign side uh in terms of the uh, online versus offline thing uh so for perspective we have had an online presence for years uh till last year around 90% of people would research the product online before they come to the stores actual sales online was around 3% that that uh, figure of 3% is closer to 15% now uh like uh, we, we are having infrastructure problems on the site because the traffic that you enjoy the uh, logistics uh, setup that you have etc all of thing everything is at you know uh, greater than 100% utilization so it's it's a you know we have to find ways of releasing resources from offline to make them available to serve customers online so that's that's one of the challenges which is going on equally because a lot of people are now turning who are used to buying offline are turning to you know doing the first transactions online what it means is we need to give them a soft landing in the world of online shopping so what we are doing around that is really using our store staff as the as the concierge so to speak uh, what we have started on a site is a, is a connect to store kind of uh, service where the customer requests a call back somebody from the nearest store calls in and assist him make, with making the purchase all the way through to making his payment by a payment link so that's that's one of the uh, new ways of working that we have figured out of course going forward a lot of such other things will have to be done in order to rebalance the the online to offline shopping uh, that we are seeing let me pick you up on this. this is an interesting point i wanted to take this up later but let me uh, pick you up on this now during normal times you know you do this attribution model you try to figure out where you spend money how did you get the customers in now during covid time that become very like for two and a half three months uh, you do not know who's you know who's interested so searches were still happening right online okay. searches were on whereas stores were shut okay. and you were also not able to do online delivery because there was a complete lockdown in the country for a good part of six weeks now that things have opened what is the difference you've seen in the attribution uh you putting to invest you know energies into your onla- online sales as well as offline offline sales you're doing online marketing what is the difference you've seen pre covid post you can tell us a little bit see uh, first off i've never been a big fan of performance marketing or attribution to my mind performance marketing is actually sales promotion with a different uh, term uh we we work on building the brand uh, building the equity of the brand whether we are using online media or offline media uh, we don't get obsessed over you know tracking one customer forward from a google click through to you know the transaction at the store never have uh, and, and in fact probably if that was the approach we had taken then we should have gone silent across uh, you know the the months of uh, april and may Uh, but that's not the way it really works i i think we are well ahead of the market in terms of uh, getting the business back and it's i think to do with the fact that we didn't go silent in april may uh, and and we kept the engagement going whether it's at a product level or at a brand level toby what's your view on that let me pick you up on this attribution modeling sorry i would really love to hear him on this since they yes. make it their agency yeah, yeah, yeah. so they are they are doing a lot of work and i'm sure i mean you can contradict your client that's okay but uh, i think i think uh i think measurement's important i think understanding uh, effectiveness you know a, a wave maker we always believe there's a better way to grow our client's business and unless we can prove that we're growing our client's business then i think we we're, we're failing so however you define measurement 
uh, against the KPI set that uh, is important to you, be that penetration, sales, share of voice, share of market, whatever it may be, then you need to be able to measure it. And, and if that means that you need uh, modeling, econometrics, uh, data. I mean, I think it's interesting, isn't it, that we spoke about, uh, Mira spoke about MetLife, uh, MetLife moving into a services almost uh, remit. And I think that's what lots of clients are doing now. Uh, how can they be of service to the consumer? And I think it's A, because a direct relationship allows you more access to more data, to more tightly understand your consumer, to better target and have a conversation with your consumer. And if you want to call it sales promotion or customer relationship marketing, CRM, then so be it. But I think any way in which you can have a, a better, uh, more relevant conversation uh, is, is a better conversation because it will mean that clients are less, uh, consumers are less uh, or consumers are more uh, tied to brand because they're getting more relevant messaging. So, uh, you know, the service is, is interesting. Uh, but as I say, I think uh, ensuring that you have relevant messaging uh, to a consumer and, and you track and you measure that to prove it's effective or not, or not, yes. and you change accordingly uh, are hugely important. But, I, you know, it depends on... Uh, uh, on, as I say, the KPIs that you're being judged against and the business ultimately is being judged against and the stakeholder returns that you're being judged against. So uh, we have... Interesting point, but tell me, uh, are there brands today who risk uh, getting too much into detailing of attribution mod modeling and letting go of the basic tenets of old-fashioned brand building? Are a lot of us now chasing performance marketing and you know chasing the entire consumer journey and not thinking about, as you said, you know, being authentic, being real, uh, making, building a brand for the long term and focusing too much on, you know, what did I do in these 30 days? Well, I, see, I, see, I see less of it in India. I mean, India, I think you probably lead the world in purpose-driven marketing, uh, which tends to be longer term. But I don't think the two are, I don't think it's as binary. I think the two are inextricably linked. Uh, and as I said, if you... Uh, you talk about the supply chain. I think that was a conversation at the beginning and the challenges around the supply chain and binge acquisitions when everyone went into lockdown. You see everyone's results in Q1. You know, clients of ours, Mondelez, alone, really strong results. Quarterly results. Everyone has to report their results to the street, to the city on a quarterly basis. Now, if you say, but don't worry, we're, we're, we're long-term brand building, we'll be back next year. Yeah, sure. The CMO, uh, and you have many uh, on, on, on the panel, you know, they, they, they won't be around. Oh, yeah. So I think you absolutely have to get the balance right. And that's what I said to Anna Rag at the beginning, is the balance between short-term and long-term and the sustainability of those sales, of good sales in the short-term, that fuel long-term brand success. And the two, as I say, it's not binary. The two are inextricably linked. That's right. Yes, let me come to you. I see you smiling away to glory. What do you have to say? So I have a different view and uh, I usually land up giving controversial views almost everywhere. Uh, but I'll still share some of the experiences okay. as to why, uh, you know, I, I think in that direction. So there is, uh, I agree, there is a set of, people that think that, okay, this is not important. I want to go with my set of values and what I think, uh, you know, we want to build as a brand. Yes, that exists. And there is no harm. There is no problem in doing that. But at the same time, I think uh, there is also, uh, you know, the, it's like this, that I, I, I have a team of probably about say 20, 25 people right now. When I talk to each of them, all of these 25 are going to think differently. The same way if you're talking to 100,000 or 200,000 people who are outside as your consumers, each of them is going to be very, very different. And each of these guys are unique. Unique in terms of interest, unique in terms of what they want to buy, unique in terms of the websites that they're coming from, going to, time that they spend, so on and so forth. So it's important that you get your message out uh, and, you know, in, in, in the way you want to do it. But it's also important that it gets communicated. If I'm talking to you and you're not listening, 
then it's really not worth it, right? I mean, there's no point in me saying something. So it's important to personalize the communication. It could be in line with what you think is your brand's ethos or you know the, the positioning that you have. But it's very important to make sure that the message gets across. And that's, that's what communication is all about. So that's one part, one part of it. The second part of it is, uh, you know, unless you measure, you really don't know what's happening with your, with your spends. Uh, there are a lot of people who, so what we do as Salesforce is we basically help brands and customers like you to basically understand as to who's doing what at what stage of their buying cycle or their, you know, what we call as the customer journey. So, which is, you could be at a stage of, you know, where you're searching for a brand to, to bring it to, you know, we selling that to you or we servicing you, the overall customer journey. And it's important for you to understand where is the bank for the buck, because that's when you will actually make that uh, investment again. So, we kind of go a little deeper. We go in terms of going and, uh, you know, we kind of get to a customer and say that, okay, you're doing, let's say, seven channels of digital marketing. Let's say the traditional channels are, let's say, an email, SMS, X, Y, Z. But are you seeing a better ROI on, let's say, a Google Ads versus a Facebook versus, let's say, uh, are you able to, you know, do you think it's better to spend on, let's say, an Insta, depending on where your consumers are? So the we basically get to a level of telling you that, okay, this is the dollar you spent on this particular platform or this channel. And this is the kind of ROI that you're seeing out of it. So you might as well spend or move that spend from one channel to the other channel. And that's uh, a lot of people, uh, you know, say that, okay, this all look good, looks good on a paper or on a slide. Uh, and, you know, maybe we'll do this as phase two or phase three or phase four. But there are a lot of people who actually implemented things like this. And now they've gone back, uh, or rather they've come back saying, okay, I do this for one division of mine. I want to now do this for, you know, the other divisions that we have in the company. So we are again seeing, you know, both sides of it. So I think uh, uh, in, in, a, in summary, it's, it's great to go by what you think you, as in, you know, the positioning that you want to have for your brand. But as long as it's uh, communicated to the uh, buyer, because otherwise there is no point in you thinking uh, that, okay, this is my brand and this is what, this is where I should be uh, spending. And, you know, this is what I should be talking about because yeah. the consumer doesn't care. And the second side of it is that unless you are able to figure out where's your spend going and what's the kind of money you're making through it, you will not spend. No, well, can I just pick up on the point? Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, no, I, I agree with most of that. I don't agree looking at things necessarily by channel. I think you need to look at the integrated communications system because individuals' channels may be fueling other areas. Something we, we've done about 1.2 million individual client journeys. We build, uh, we've got a, a global approach uh, which looks at trigger phases and uh, priming phases which ensures that we understand through the lens of a consumer versus a channel how to uh, react. So agree with most of it, but I think you have to look at an integrated uh, communication solution, not necessarily just by channel. Shubha, let me come to you uh, with all the you know, various categories of things you're doing. How do you crack the personalization piece, especially in times like these, when you're saying you in three months, you launch 12 new, you know, products. What's, what's the secret sauce? So, uh, going back to uh, basically what we started doing as lockdown set in, I think one of the agility has always been one of the most critical factors of, uh, you know, that we've always looked at agility as a very important piece of the work that we do, the way we work, Nagan. And like I told you earlier, this whole piece of listening in to consumers and the change in the way that they were prioritizing, what gets into the house, what is most essential. In fact, that piece was critical for us in turning around. You know, these 12 launches that I talked about under the Protect umbrella. Uh, apart from that, like I said, we've actually challenged every motion in terms of how we work, you know. 
the speed at which we work, the way that uh, see one is that saying that I'll go by all the established SOP and our ways of working and the systems that we always worked and the way that we work till now. Now each of us, all of us across the team, we've seen that we've sort of looked at the challenge in front of us. We've looked that all of us have been totally engaged. We have a fairly large team. We've been totally engaged in listening to conversations, taking feedback, and this is more of a you know huge amount of collaboration that's actually behind this uh, launch that I'm talking about. But I think also most importantly, we were just talking about a lot of data right now, data and measurement. So that's another very important piece. One is launching. The second is you know there is also simultaneous testing. and the feedback that is actually being taken in from consumers that's also going to be as we go uh, speed of testing speed of improvising that's going to be a very vital component for us uh, as we proceed and uh, the customization piece that you are talking about now as you know uh, digital is where you can customize a lot of communication Uh, on your mass media options, specifically linear TV, it's not really possible. But in between, there was this phase, you know, just as we entered lockdown, you know, all shoots were stopped, and in fact, shoots have just resumed, right? Yeah. Uh, we've actually used a lot of user-generated uh, communication in these months of uh, April and May, specifically. Lot of uh, engaging user-generated communication, involving consumers. That's one part, you know, to drive the point, to resonate a lot, and that's really uh, sort of worked well for us. Uh, coming to the specifics, as we continue further, now that shoots have resumed, we are back to you know shooting TV series the same old known way. Uh, i am sure there is going to be a thematic communication which is going to continue but our window of how we are going to view it you know there is i don't think we are going to continue with these films now running for 2 3 years without being you know questioned because today we live in a sort of 6 6 month to 6 month kind of a thing time frame so if required we are ready to adapt and churn out new communication we are equipped to turn around communication in a much faster way we also sort of identified ways in which we can work around along with our partners and i also have to say this specifically that a great amount of collaboration and you know shift in the way we work with across our partners and uh, today we are pretty confident that we will churn around any kind of customized communication that we require in much shorter spans of time right meera uh, if i come back to you uh, what's your uh, sense uh, again what you sell is across categories across point price points so when you look at the personalization piece how does it work for you especially during a time like this when everything is locked down and things are challenging how do you do, uh, handle the personalization piece the personalization is possible where you are able to target individually and obviously that that happens in two uh, areas one is of uh, one is of course digital marketing and the other one is uh, in cases like medlife where we have our own app and our own website and you have people registered and with with a purchase history obviously a lot of personalization is possible over there so uh, and personalization can't uh, or to be a little realistic uh, and to be a little more common sensical personalization is more about segmentation right That's so right. you are able to segment customers into meaningful clusters and segments and then decide what you can do best in terms of personalizing uh, your messaging to them uh, so in a in in a category like ours uh, the most uh, or, or the most in, inherent classification is basis patient clusters so you have diabetic patients versus heart patients versus thyroid patients versus respiratory care patients etc so a diabetic yeah. patient is more interested in figuring out what is the impact of this pandemic on them and how is it different as compared to a non diabetic right so we are able to personalize messages across to these people similarly uh, you know when you have uh, or you can have personalization even based on language groups right 
so uh, we have uh, we we actually launched during this period and it, of course development had started much before the pandemic got announced but uh, in march uh, we launched our vernacular app with hindi as the first language that we gave a choice to our customers and what a difference it made uh, in terms of uh, you know language personalization almost 55% of our orders outside of the metro suddenly came from the hindi app and not the english app right so personalization uh, can can be at various levels but it's level. yeah, yeah. to personalize uh, either on digital as a medium or if you have your own platform over there for customers and there too it is really about meaningful segmentation into some large clusters one on one is uh, simply you know more utopian as a thought tell me uh, you know in many cases personalization and contextualization go hand in hand and for a category like yours contextualization must be tough because you know as i said earlier uh it is easy to identify but again there's a danger of crossing the line right when when you're talking about contextualization for things like medicines right so how do you find that balance i actually tend to disagree uh, contextualization when it uh, and see health is such a personal thing and uh, given that the base of medlife is predominantly a chronic base of patients who buy medicines every month like they buy groceries yeah. right Uh, so given that contextualization actually helps make customers feel even more engaged with you and love you even more for the fact that you are giving them very relevant yeah. information right because i like i told you and this is not particular to just covid if you look at the overall trust in what people come across either on uh, you know some social media wall or on whatsapp as a forward the level of trust is very low and there is always a question mark whether this is fake or this is genuine right and given this that in general information and information around health also suffers from that kind of paranoia of it being fake or genuine to be able to contextualize health information and health related information to people basis the conditions that they suffer from actually makes for a wonderful way to engage as well as retain them so it's actually the opposite right atit uh, you know you deal with a category uh, especially the younger ones children where you know communication has a lot of challenges uh, how do you communicate how much do you communicate how much commercialization do you want to bring into the entire space so again personalization and contextualization become like very difficult balls to juggle so what are the what are the things that you you keep in mind when you when you go to your you know young customers Uh, and 12 year olds are not you know sort of young but younger lot where part of the communication is to the parent and the rest is to the child uh, itself so what are how do you dabble these two uh, pieces you're on mute atit you'll have to unmute yourself yeah so it's an ongoing challenge uh, which has been there for a long period of time wherein your customer base and your consumer base is different so now with the type of product range which we have which caters from a 3 year old going up to a 16 year old lot of personalization needs to happen and as uh, meera was saying that it's all about creating your cohorts or your segmentation whether it ca- it can be on use case study it can be on uh, market prioritization it can be on language it can be also on grade so we do lot of amount of data and we do lot of amount of understanding in terms of that what is the consumer is requiring and create a sort of a cohort parallelly the kid is still not going to swipe the card to buy the product it is going to be the parent so a generic conversation as an air cover has to happen which is your typical reach frequency based advertising wherein the parents is aware of the product while the communication is designed in such a way especially on a digital platform that it is very very customized and personalized and then so that that's on the personalization part and contextually a lot of things uh, we try to do contextually we believe that we are doing a great job but more often than not we become very tactical on that matter so it's very important to also understand that if you are doing something which is contextual which is to the time it it needs to be not a one off thing but it's something which we can sustain and it rolls back into your overall strategy approach and it's it's, it's still uh wearing the lens of a personalization so it's a very tricky situation it's a challenging situation but the advantage which we have is that we are 
at start we are a tech company and it's an edu uh, edu tech company so there's a lot of tech and a lot of support happening in terms of understanding the data finding out what the consumers want so over a period of time as experience comes in as more and more consumers come in and more and more cohorts gets created which are then now repeat users and a lot of other interaction it becomes very clear that these are four or five things which one needs to do and if you do that right and if you do it consistently more often than not uh, your business objective and your marketing objective gets delivered perfect so we have 5 minutes i i want to do one last round of questions before i take a couple of audience questions you know innovation in our business is a often used abused term right and last 3 4 months have been tough for businesses on the personal front but i want to ask each each one of you if there is something truly innovative that you've noticed it could be your brand you've done something or noticed outside for the sake of our audience and our listeners i'd like to know from you because you you guys handle as i said brands across categories and you are in a position where you also get exposed to a lot of work other companies are doing so atit let me start with you uh, something truly innovative you've seen in the last 3 months or you have done that that you think uh, has covid specifically has pushed you into doing it which might not have happened otherwise no as i said the we 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 were called by juice the learning app while learning remains learning is what you are you are learning it from a pre recorded academics content and yeah. because of the situation we we started teaching and teaching is live classes so that was one big innovation but i think all edu edutech players did that everybody had the resources they had the bandwidth and they had the ecosystem to create that so i would not say that's an innovation that was the need of the hour everybody was very flexible very agile very nimble footed to create something which is teaching which is helping the larger uh, student ecos- ecosystem but something which really came to my notice is all the especially in in the event space now we all know what has happened on to those events but for example exchange for media you guys are now getting people every second day and having a conversation which probably was not happening in terms of frequency so now had not been the situation we would have continued uh, meeting in a five star ho- uh, hotel having this conversation of uh, over a cup of coffee but we are doing it more often more inputs are coming in from like minded people from like minded people from the industry so this i think is a great innovation in terms of getting more and more connects happening compared to a physical world so i think this is an innovation the fmcg category with launching whether it is levers whether it is uh, godrej whether it is marico whether it is uh, somebody else all the health protection conversation which are happening across the board in terms of what you need to do the personalization happening coming in from specialist coming from insurance guys coming in from a person like a medlife in terms of it's coming from a doctor so coming from an authority with lot of credibility i think is a great innovation in terms of driving it might not be an award winning thing but it's creating a huge social impact perfect i think very good example so we again you have a you know helicopter level view as well as a you know ground level view so tell us couple of things that you know that has impressed you well one that i think came to the fore that wasn't actually born out of covid is the work that l'oreal are doing with modi face which is a, a an augmented reality business they bought 2 years ago but given the amount of people at home i don't know about uh, anyone who's got kids but mine seem to have various different colored hair uh, for most of the week and i think being able to interact Uh, and again it comes back to that utility l'oreal getting into being a you know a services business so i thought that was a great piece of work uh, i think the work that we did as wpp as wave maker for the world health organization uh, we helped in real time through pro bono we we generated circa 50 million dollars worth of free advertising across multiple flat platforms across multiple markets Uh, and then we're feeding that back into uh, our creative partners to build content uh, for for the available space to get the messaging out about washing hands, about staying home. Uh, as I say, uh, you know, we're talking about uh, experts and having that uh, that understanding that if it's coming from an expert, people. Uh, believe it and trust it and there's no no better expert than the world health organization so enormously proud of the work that the team did on that perfect meera what's your take so well, i think in, in terms of innovation um, and, and i'm not going to really restrict myself to marketing the point is that through yeah. a and b and even now 
given the fact that industry and in the industrial output and production has been disrupted for all physical goods and services managing supply chain has been one of the most critical challenges through this entire period and continues to be so um and here is where i think uh, one innovation that medlife did and fairly quickly and i'm uh, glad we did it in in flat 2 to 2 to 3 weeks time was really introducing the concept of substitution on the app which means that uh, if you need paracetamol if if you are searching for crocin and crocin is not there in stock to offer the customer calpol or a dolo instead which is also the same composition and tell the customer that take this this will come to you immediately instead of crocin which is currently out of stock right so i think uh, innovation to really manage the difficulties that we were facing in supplies and supply chain side uh, helped us a lot in terms of ensuring that uh, almost 20% of the orders which otherwise would have basically not happened or would not have converted on the platform because of stock availability issues managed coming our way and we were able to service customers and take care of their health uh, requirements and issues at that point in time fantastic pritesh uh, sorry i am just rushing through because we are out of time and i want to take a couple of audience questions sure. so i think uh, this has been a time when human ingenuity has really been uh, you know brought to the fore i think a lot of people have done amazing stuff uh starting with the you know the the vegetable walas from nasik and the mango guys from uh, you know alibag finding a way to you know reach bombay with their stuff is great innovation uh for chroma i think the simple thing of creating a connect to store facility with a with a you know uh an appointment booking facility on the site has been a fantastic innovation because it's allowed people to shop from home allowed me to manage the social distancing norms in my store uh, but the biggest innovation which i think is a great signal to the entire world that we are heading to coming back to normal is is the you know the england versus west indies series the way it's been conducted i think how they have brought it together kept the joy of the game as much as possible to the extent of you know playing uh, an audience noise as as the game progresses i think it's amazing thinking Yeah, I mean, I was watching F1 as well as soccer this weekend, and you know, thank God, live sporting action is back. Let's see yeah, it comes back. Brilliant. So, Yashdeep, uh, again, a uh, lot of categories to deal with. What are the interesting things you've seen? I say so. One of the interesting things that we've seen is, um, you know, it's 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 a hotel chain, one of the five star brands in India. uh what they've done is just to make sure that the uh team is not impacted uh in these times when people are not dining there they basically pick up uh food orders okay through an app and deliver it to a customer who basically wants to have something of that particular hotel that's one and the other one that i've seen is where we've been able to move something that was completely offline uh, which is a retail store uh into an in giving them a completely online experience this is across uh not just uh, the standard channels but like to be mentioned which is across the sales service and marketing so these are two that i think uh, have been some good work that we've done in the last four months fantastic last word shubha you need to un- un- we can't hear you yeah i was in mute so two examples that i'll quickly talk uh, protect so far was a brand which was around hand hygiene hell we competed more with you know the hand wash category now bringing that and today integrating that into an entire range which talks about health the overall health of a family that's one home example but i think all the examples that you know all Uh, the panel has spoke about there are actually much many more examples and there is so much of innovation all around us but as a human you know what really touches the chord for me is that you know health and hygiene which have been so paramount to human species as a survival in these four months the amount of time and the amount of heightened sense of knowledge that collectively the world has sort of gathered and today the way people pay so much attention and are so responsive to any messaging on health and paying so much of attention to their own health to their own lives that part to me is the most intriguing part you know and the example in fact for me somebody spoke of you just spoke of 
England West Indies series. For me, the surreal moment was when I saw the English Premier League, and you know, it was just unbelievable. At that point, it hit that you know, oh, events are back, sports is back, live sporting is back. So I think three moments that I can share with you. Fantastic. I have a lot of audience questions. Let me just take a couple of them uh, since we are out of time. So the first is I'll direct it to Shubha and Ritesh. How are you okay. all doing the great Indian festive celebration consumption story this year? It's an interesting mm. question. It talks about the overall okay. economy. What do you think will happen between August and December? Okay. So, uh, can I take that first? Yes, absolutely. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, we've seen sort of some positive, you know, signals. Uh, through the last week of june and uh, july and uh, we are pretty positive and hopeful that things are going to pick up this festive definitely it's not going to be as great as you know it used to be it's going to be a little muted but compared to what we've gone through in the last 4 5 months certainly looks like hope uh, pretty hopeful for us great. but then having said that it does not mean that we will have to be very, very uh, sort of uh, be very prudent. We'll have to be very uh, clear about you know focusing on efficiencies or measurements. These are continuously going to be important for us as well. Yeah, for me, I think uh, see electronics is 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 uh, uh, in okay, uh, and it's not going to change very rapidly. Uh, people, in fact, at a larger level, homes are. Uh, far more important than they have been in a long time. Uh, festive, the money goes into apparel, it goes into jewelry, it goes into gifting, and it goes into the home. Uh, I think there will be a rebalancing of spends this festive, focusing on anything that goes into the home. And, and uh, electronics will be part of it. The challenge I foresee is on the supply chain part. But more and more as we move forward, components uh, are a problem. Um, and there is also the China issue, uh, and and electronics is a huge dependence on China. If not for the finished product, definitely for uh, components. So supply side, there I see lots of uh, challenges. On the demand side, not so much. Toby, what's the sense you get from your India colleagues? Uh, last three months have been really tough for the Indian ecosystem. Do they see significant pickup in the festive season? Uh, yes, <laughs> I, I, I smile only because I said to uh, Anurag at the beginning how optimistic you are as a, as a country, and I think the forecasts from our team just replicate that. Uh, but I, I uh, there's definitely upside. You know, you look at the, I always look at new business as a barometer for how lively the the market is, and you can really see now. A lot of pitches coming to the fore, a lot of new business opportunities. So I think if that's anything to go by, uh, then we should we should see a good uh, a good back half of the year. I don't think it's going to be as strong as maybe some of my colleagues think, uh, but certainly returning to growth in Q3, uh, you know, is 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 good. Growth is good at the moment, right? You know, we've been back. We estimate in India circa twenty plus percent. So any sort of growth in Q3, Q4 is going to be good. So I think single digits, uh, if we could get high single digits, I'd be, I'd be very happy. But uh, no Cricket World Cup, I think, will impact if, if that goes along. So yes, Diwali, yes, festivals, but uh, I, I think a lot of money was riding on the, on the Cricket World Cup. That's so right. um, impacted. Anyway, that comes back next year, Olympics and the Cricket World Cup. Last Everything's year. back next year. More sport than you can... Yeah. And from a low base this year, we grow even higher next year. So look at the positive side. You know, next year is going to be 30, 40 percent growth for every product. There you go. You see. Yeah. <laughs> Last question now. What do you think will be the impact of COVID on the outdoor media business? So there is obviously a short-term impact. It's it's quite steep, significant. But do you think going forward, say 12 months out, if you were to look at it, would it have changed the business fundamentally in any way? Me, uh, well, I think. I think what COVID's done, as I said, is it's fueled innovation. And I think those outdoor media owners that innovate, that digitize, uh, will come out incredibly strong. I think those that don't, uh, 
uh, will, will struggle. I mean, I think outdoor will come out of it stronger than print. Uh, I know it's a relatively strong uh, media in, in India, but I think if I look around the world, I think COVID really, really will impact print and, and decimate that. But I don't think uh, I don't think outdoor needs to worry. I think if it can digitise, it can personalise its messaging or, or what I would call relevance at scale uh, and, and become inextricably linked with retail, there's a bright future for outdoor. Fantastic. Thank you, Tony. We are out of time, so I'll... Uh... We'll have to end it here. Thank you, Tony, for joining us. Meera, Ritesh, Atit, Shubha, and uh, Yashdeep. Uh, thank you uh, for taking time out and uh, for sharing valuable insights. Thank you to Salesforce for uh, having let us organize this. Till next time, stay safe and hope to see you uh, uh, soon for another webinar. Thank you. Till we